This shiur is dedicated to the memory of my father, David Malik, David ben Aharon Svi Vishendo. He died on November 19th, 2019, the 21st of Cheshvan, 5780. His first year at site was yesterday, November 8th, 2020, 21st of Cheshvan, 5781. I actually did the Shi'or live yesterday, but I forgot to record it, so hence the recording the day after. When my dad died in November, last Cheshvan, I started saying Kaddish for him immediately. But as part of the mourning process for my dad and to elevate his neshama, I started the Daf Yomi cycle, the daily page of Talmud study. And I started it this past January, 2020. Uh, I was in Israel there for Hanukkah and afterwards and on the way to the airport, on the way to Ben Gurion airport, on the radio, there was a recording, when I recording, it was live, uh, the Siyum, the conclusion of the seven and a half year cycle of Talmud study. And I'd always known about Dafyomi. It always seemed like something I might do in the future, but it seemed to me really a siman, a sign, that as I was going back to the States, going to the airport on the way back to the States, that there was this Siyum, the Kaddish that you say at the end of a Siyum was, loud and clear on the radio and I committed to myself right then and there that I was going to mark the morning period and honor my dad's memory by starting the Dafyomi cycle. So as I mentioned, it takes seven and a half years to complete the entire Shas, the entire Shisha, Shisha Sidre Mishnah, the six orders of Mishnah and Gemara that constitute the Talmud. And so I started in January, the first Masachet, the first tractate we studied was Masachet Brachot, and that was a long one. And we started in January and it lasted until March. It was right before COVID, yes, because we were supposed, there were supposed to be some seum gatherings for the tractate conclusion and they had to be canceled. They were around Purim time. But there was a, uh, that, that was, yes, so that first one ended in March. The second tractate was Masachat Shabbat. Actually, that was a long one. Masachat Brachot, not as long. Masachat Brachot uh, ended in March. Masachat Shabbat started immediately then and went all the way through August. And then from August until November 22nd is Masachat Erevim. I had originally intended to finish the tractate two weeks earlier before the international seum in order to be able to honor my dad's memory. But it's very fast paced, even doing just one daf of Talmud a day. And I really enjoy the learning that I've been doing and some of the podcasts I've been listening to to enrich my learning. And I want to participate in the CUM on November 22nd. That's virtual online with hadron.org or possibly with Talking Talmud. Uh, hadron.org is the, t the shiur and the seum led by Rabbanit Michelle Cohen-Farber and Talking Talmud is the podcast that is led by Yardena Osband and Ann Gordon. I've been listening to those a lot as well as to some others here and there. So I decided uh, I'm gonna let the seum be the seum, the conclusion of the tractate be then, but this shiur is going to be some snippets from Masechet Eruvin, kind of a preview of a, of a seum, but I, I'm going to spend the first half of this shiur talking about the tractate and some of its teachings in very general terms. And then for the second half of the shiur, I will connect some of the texts of a ravine to my dad. So let me begin by sharing the screen just to show you a couple of things. Uh, first of all, Masecha uh, Erevim. There are 10 chapters, 10 prakim. There are 96 mishnayot and 105 dapim. Right now on the cycle, we just started chapter nine and on November 22nd, we will have finished chapter 10 and that's when the conclusion, the seum for the tractate will be, as I said. So the chapter names are 
מבואי שהוא גבוה, עושים פסים בכל מערבין, בכל מערבין, מי שהוציאוהו, כיצד מעברין, הדר, חלון, כיצד משתתפים, כל גגות אין המוצא תפילין. There are many terms that came up during this Masechet. I'm not going to go over all of them, but just a few uh, that I do want to mention. First, Lamet Het Malachot, the 39 Malachot. Uh, those are the 39 prohibitive activities, act, prohibited activities on Shabbat, uh, all derived from some of the work that was done to construct and to transport the Mishkan, the tabernacle in biblical times. And the 39 categories of Shabbat are connected to the Mishkan for a variety of reasons. Uh, but one of the conceptual links that really resonate for me is the idea that Shabbat is a sanctuary in time and it mirrors, reflects the sanctuary in space that was the Mishkan. So that on Shabbat, when we abstain from doing certain activities, we are essentially creating holy time. We are creating sacred time that parallels the sacred space that was the, the tabernacle. And I'm not actually going to go over the other terms now. I'll do that as we go along. Um, the only, I guess, these are two really important ones that will be mentioned quite a few times is Rashut HaYachid and Rashut HaRabim. Rashut HaYachid is private domain and Rashut HaRabim is public domain. Okay, so you don't need to see all those terms. I also had a lot of calculations on there of uh, some of the biblical units of measurement, the tefach and the ama, the tefach being the hand's breadth, the ama being the cubit, and there's six tefachim in a, in a cubit, in an ama, and a lot of those numbers appear over and over again um, in the Masechet. Do not need to bore you with all of those details. Okay, so I want to begin by saying that Masechet Shabbat, which is the tractate that precedes Erevin, in that Masechet, the rabbis of the Talmud were primarily concerned with defining malacha and avoiding malacha. Malacha is the singular of the word malachot that I just defined. Uh, so malacha uh, is one of the 39 categories of prohibited creative activity on Shabbat. So the rabbis in Masechet Shabbat, they explored many different kinds of malachot. Probably the most recurrent and complex malacha of that tractate, it was a long tractate, 157 dapim, 157 pages. But one malacha that kept coming up over and over again was malacha number 39, known as hotza'a me reshut le reshut. Carrying, uh, taking out objects from one domain to the next, carrying items from the private domain to the public domain, from Rashut HaYachid to Rashut HaRabim, and also from Rashut HaRabim to Rashut HaYachid, also the prohibition against carrying anything in Rashut HaRabim, the public domain, more than Dalet Amot, more than four cubits. Carrying is a particularly inconvenient prohibition. It means you can't casually grab a challah or a bottle of wine from your kitchen and bring it to your friend's house across the street for a Shabbos meal. It means that you can't bring your house keys to shul. It means you can't schlep a child through the streets in a stroller. To ease the burden of this restriction, this prohibition against carrying on Shabbos, the rabbis devised the concept of an eruv a Hebrew word that literally means mixture. An Eruv is a way of combining various private and public domains together uh, to create a space that, for the purpose of carrying, is considered one private domain. So for example, if a city has walls around it, a city like Jerusalem, that wall constitutes an Eruv, and an observant Jew can carry items anywhere within that city. But even a community, even a city, a town, a neighborhood that does not have a pre-existing structure, does not have a, a city wall around it, these areas can also construct an Eru to enable its residents to carry on Shabbat. In fact, in many communities, uh, most communities, an Eru consists primarily of uh, wire strung on poles, 
often using existing poles and wires, as in the telephone poles and wires. An A roof has the potential, uh, the, pa the power to define and to create and build community. In order for neighbors who are Shomer Shabbos, who do observe Shabbat, in order them, for them, us, uh, to be able to carry objects between houses or within a shared courtyard on Shabbat, they have to create a kind of Eruv that's known as Eruv Chatzerot. So Eruv is really shorthand for the phrase Eruv Chatzerot. There's other forms of Eruvin as well, uh, one of which is covered later on in the tractate known as Eruv Tehumim, but uh, Shabbos boundaries, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But an Eruv Chatzerot is literally a joining of courtyards. And it's done not only by the construction of poles and strings and whatever uh, to define this space as one private domain, but also there is an aspect of it where the neighbors contribute to a single food basket that is placed in one neighbor's house. And the food collection is a tangible expression of the fact that all of the neighbors have joint ownership over this area, almost like a, a kibbutz that eats communal meals together. But what happens if, say, not all the neighbors want to participate? Let's say some of the neighbors are a little standoffish. Can you build an Eruv if the neighbors don't buy into the group mentality? This is a question that Eliza Salzberg Yitzhar poses in her commentary on Erevin Daf 49, page 49, Daf Memtet. And I want to share this text with you. There we go. Let's make this bigger. Okay, so this is uh, Erevim Memtet Amud Aleph. It's from chapter four, Misha Hotsuyuhu. And I'll read in Hebrew and then translate. Amar Rav Yehuda Amar Shmuel. Rav Yehuda said, that Shmuel said, Rav Yehuda in Shmuel's name, said, Hamakpid al Eruvo, ein Eruvo Eruv. With regard to one who is particular about his Eruv, that is, that the other people should not eat of the food he contributed, his Eruv is not a valid Eruv. Ein Eruvo Eruv. Ma Shemo, Eruv Shemo. After all, what is its name? Joining, Eruv is its name, indicating that it must be jointly owned. Rabbi Chanina Amar, Eruvo Eruv, Ela Shenikra Me'anshe Vardina. Rabbi Hanina said, even in that case, his Eruv is a valid Eruv. However, the person is called one of the men of Vardina. The men of Vardina were renowned to be misers. Uh, so when you call someone one of the men of Vardina, you're saying that he is considered to be like one of them. So you have these two different opinions, Shmuel and Rabbi Hanina, about whether or not someone who is standoffish, whether they're, that would be considered a valid Eruv. So what does it mean to be particular about the Eruv? What does it mean when Shmuel is referring to someone who is particular about his Eruv? It means that he's anxious to get his food back from the collection bowl. So yes, I will symbolically give my loaf of bread to this Eruv, but do not touch it under any circumstances. Shmuel believes that when you maintain this individual ownership over your own contribution, that this invalidates the Eruv because the joining of several homes and a courtyard into a single domain is accomplished by relinquishing, if only symbolically, but relinquishing your individual ownership of your food and of the yard. So later on in the daf, later on in the page, the Gemara makes the point more explicit when it suggests that the collecting of food in one person's home effectively joins all of the various households into one commune, essentially, for the duration of Shabbos. 
Rabbi Hanina disagrees with Shmuel. He says, yeah, it may be miserly. It may be, you know, not the greatest thing in the world to take back your own personal loaf or to think about how you want to take back that personal loaf from the joint bowl. But the ritual act of Eruv is symbolic regardless. As long as you go through the motions of adding to the joint basket, the Eruv is valid. It's kosher. Elisa Salzberg Yitzhar, in her commentary, she says, uh, she writes as follows. She says, we might think of these two positions with a modern analogy. Shmuel pictures the Eruv as a potluck, where everyone contributes and no one checks whether you bought expensive cheese or cheap crackers. If you come to a potluck with one sandwich and eat it by yourself, you're missing out on a core part of the experience. But Rabbi Hanina thinks of the Eruv like a school pizza party where each parent pays for exactly what the child eats. The parents don't have to be friends, just a partnership exists. And to Rabbi Hanina, that kind of partnership is sufficient for an Eruv. In modern times, we still fulfill this food collection requirement when constructing an Eruv even if we do so minimalistically, um, in addition to the string or the pole or the fence that marks the outer boundaries of the domain, that uh, the domain that's supposed to be considered uh, part of the same reshoot, the same uh, property covered by the Eruv, there's usually a synagogue that, that holds on to a quantity of food. Usually it's a box of matzah, since matzah is something that doesn't go stale so readily. And the matzah, the box of matzah, represents the food contributions of all of the homes, all of the communities that are included in the Eruv. No one is likely to actually eat from that box of matzah, uh, certainly not at a celebratory citywide picnic, but it's a symbolic gesture of partnership. And this box of matzah fulfills the minimum form of partnership. So kind of like Rabbi Hanina and his school pizza party analogy. So we can use that, and that still would be considered a valid Eruv. We can aspire, though, even though that's allowed as, minim as the minimal requirement for an Eruv, we still should and can, can and should aspire to use the Eruv as a means of building camaraderie between communities, between individuals in a community, and the diverse people who rely on it. Now, there's some people who refer to the Eruv as a legal fiction in derogatory terms. And I think perhaps a better way to think of the Eruv is as an incredibly innovative, creative construction of rabbinic law. It's a structure that reflects the seemingly infinite rabbinic patience with the complicated balancing act of setting apart Shabbat as a special day, while recognizing the fact that human beings don't have infinite patience for inconvenience. The Eruv heightens our awareness of what defines a sacred space, what defines a dwelling place, and what defines community. There's another commentary of, on My Jewish Living. I think, what is it called My Jewish Living? MJL. Uh, it's written, this one is written by Rabbi Abi Sosland, and it's hers is, her commentary is on a different daf, a different page. It's Eruvim 59, uh, Nuntet. The other one was Mamchan, I think. Uh, anyway, she writes, an Eruv allows a somewhat freer, a more lenient observance of Shabbat, but it is predicated on a highly strictive, uh, a more stringent law that considers carrying even a small item on Shabbat to be forbidden labor. Even as the rabbis consider various ways to ease the burdens of Shabbat restrictions, they are mindful to uphold the strictures of the law itself and to maintain observant Jews' awareness of these restrictions. You know, legal loopholes, they only work if we still remember the original law that existed before the loopholes. And, you know, there are some communities uh, who declare an Eruv to be inoperative occasionally, just so people will remember the original restriction. I, the rabbis in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, they declare the Eruv to be inoperative once a year. It's a custom that was initiated by Rabbi Pinchas Tights as a mean of means of educating the members of that community about the prohibition against carrying on Shabbat. Because otherwise, uh, people raised in Elizabeth carrying within the Eruv on Shabbat, they might not relate and re realize um, that it's only permitted because of the existence of the Eruv. In its very detailed discussions of leniencies and stringencies of Eruv, 
this tractate of Erevin reminds us that the Eruv only works as a way of expanding Jewish law if we live by Jewish law in the first place. It's right in the middle of uh, that balancing act between expansiveness and limitation that meaningful religious life can be found. In chapter two of Masechet Erevin on Daf Kaf Gimel 23, Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava teaches that carrying is only permitted in an enclosed space if it resembles a living space. But on the other hand, Rabbi Akiva and other rabbis maintain that all that matters in determining whether an enclosed space is suitable for carrying on Shabbat is its size. And in determining what that size is, the rabbis, they refer to the dimensions of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, that portable sanctuary that was used in biblical times before the days of the temple, before the days of the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, the Mishkan measured about 5,000 square cubits, amot, and as long as the enclosed space is no larger than 5,000 square cubits, it's permissible to carry within that space on Shabbat, according to Rabbi Akiva. And I think it's really interesting to consider why the rabbis, some rabbis, considered the Mishkan's measurements to serve as a model for Eruv. Before I share some of those ideas, I just want to show you the text, at least one of the texts that refers to the Mishkan, right here on Daf Bet Amun Aleph in chapter one. No, uh, it's actually the first page, although it's called page two. <laughs> there is no page one of any tractate of Talmud. It always starts on page two. And here, Rav Yehuda said that Rav said, the rabbis derived this halacha that an opening more than 20 cubits high is not considered an entrance from the doorway of the sanctuary, the inner sanctum of the temple. Rabbi Yehuda derived this opinion that even an opening more than 20 cubits, 20 amot high, is considered an entrance from the doorway of the entrance hall leading into the sanctuary, as we learned in a Mishnah, the doorway of the sanctuary of the Heichal is 20 amot high and 10 amot wide, and that of the Ulam of the entrance hall is 40 amot high and 20 amot wide. So don't worry about the details. <laughs> but I think it's really important uh, to consider why the Mishkan's measurements serve as a model for some of these discussions about Eruv. The era of leniencies that are derived from the Mishkan makes sense because the 39 categories of prohibitive activity on Shabbat are derived from the construction of the Mishkan. I'm going to share a screen a diagram here. So this is taken from a book called the 39 Malachot of Shabbat or Avot Malacha of Shabbat. Uh, I know it's very small, it's hard to see, uh, but basically this is a diagram of the Mishkan the tabernacle, and in the corners here are descriptions or listings actually of the 39 malachot and how they derive from certain activities that were used to construct or transport the mishkan. So for example here, um, can, I, can I get any more? Yes, so the 39th malacha is carrying. The purpose of that malacha uh, in original, in the biblical times was to move the pillars from the wagons to a public area, a Rashida Rabim, and vice versa. Uh, also, carrying was an activity that was used in bringing the masro, the tithes for the Mishkan, from the tents to a public area. So from this is derived today uh, the malacha of carrying, the prohibition against carrying. And you can see some of the other malachot here and how they connect to different aspects of the construction or transport of the Mishkan. So building, demolishing, writing, erasing, etc. So one of the things I think it's important to note about the Mishkan is that it was viewed as God's dwelling place. The very words that we use to describe the Mishkan and also the Beit HaMikdash, the temple uh, in later days, remind us of the fact that this is God's home. So yes, God is everywhere, but the locus of God's presence and where we direct our kavanah, our intentionality, our mindfulness is either the Mishkan or the Beit HaMikdash or was in biblical times. So the Hebrew word Mishkan literally means the dwelling place of God's presence, the Shekhinah. 
and Shekhinah and Mishkan are connected to each other etymologically. The Hebrew way of referring to the Temple Mount is Har Habayit, which literally means the mountain of the home, the home of God. Rabbi Michelle Cohen Farber, who is, as I said, the teacher of uh, the Hadron Talmud study for women and also has been really the driving force behind the whole effort of doing Talmud study among women and to have a seum that's for women as well as men. Uh, she introduces Masechet Eruvin in her first podcast for this tractate. She points out the connection between the measurements for Eruv and the measurements of the Mishkan, as well as measurements of the Sukkah, which I think is interesting. She brings in the Sukkah as well. She says that all three of these topics, Eruv, Mishkan, and Sukkah, all involve the creation of sacred space. They're taking something mundane, making it holy. Carrying is an everyday mundane act, but we make it holy by abstaining from it on Shabbat or by constructing an Eruv to make it possible to carry on Shabbat. So in that way, we're creating a Shinui, a different uh, sacred way of carrying on Shabbat than on other days of the week. An Eruv is essentially a means of changing the identity of a space in a very Jewish way. Constructing an Eruv is part of a holy halachic enterprise. So essentially, God's dwelling place becomes a model for our own dwellings. For the rabbis, God's presence is imminent. I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. It's here. It's now. It's not just up in the heavens. It's here on earth. God's home is another home in the neighborhood, essentially. So it makes sense that the descriptions of God's home and courtyards come to teach us what our own homes and courtyards are supposed to be look like are supposed to look like. And I believe that implicit in this notion is the challenge, how can we turn our own personal spaces into sacred spaces where God dwells? I want to shift focus to my dad. I was looking through my second Eruvine to try and find some text that resonated with me that connects him how to my dad. I'd say in general, uh, the entire Masechet uh, reminds me of my dad because my dad was the one who helped me through 10th grade geometry when I first moved to New Jersey. And there's a lot of geometry in Erevin, a lot of measurements and uh, honestly, some areas of study that were beyond my immediate comprehension. I think dad would have been able to help a lot. But in addition to that specific text, so there's this one, one of my favorite texts in Erevin, I don't think has really anything to do with my dad, and I was trying really hard to find a connection, so I, I need to at least share it with you briefly, because uh, it's just a fun text. Let me share the screen. One day I'll get better at this. <laughs> okay, there we go. I don't know if I have the right text highlighted. I don't. All right, let's try that again. Okay, this is from Eruvin Pevav Amud Aleph, 86a. It's from chapter 8, Ketzad Mishtadfin. And there's a saying in here. Oftentimes in the Talmud, there is this phrase... De Amri Inchi, uh, De Amri Inashe is how it's vocalized here. A common saying, the way we have common sayings today, like uh, a stitch in time saves nine, the early bird catches the worm. Oftentimes the Talmud says that, and then of course it's some saying that I've never heard of before, some kind of aphorism, a truism. Nevach bach kalba ul, nevach bach guraita pok, which is translated as, if a male bar dog barks at you, enter. If a female dog barks at you, leave. And there is some connection here with going to your son, daughter's house, daughter's-in-law, sons-in-law. I tried really hard to find some connection to my dad, but none of it would have been flattering to any of the parties involved, myself included. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on that text, but I needed to just share it with you briefly.
So here on Eruvin 53a in the Gemara, there's a machloket, a, oh, wait, that's not what I wanted to do, this one, on 73a, Ayin Gimel Amud Aleph. Uh, also a machloket between Rav and Shmuel. So it's a difference of opinion regarding how you define a person's place of dwelling. Rav said a person's place of dwelling is determined by the place where he eats his bread, mikom pita. And Shmuel said a person's place of dwelling is determined by the place where he sleeps. Shmuel says mikom lina. And that reminds me very much of uh, the Dishner's experience, the Dishner's non-bungalow colony, bungalow colony. Well, I guess it was a bungalow colony, but a different kind of bungalow colony with the Kuchelein. This idea of, I never really understood what this meant. Uh, you know, in the Talmud, I don't know if I would have quite gotten this idea of your dwelling place versus your place where you eat, because doesn't everybody uh, sl sleep and eat in the same place. For most people, that's the case most of the time. But in Dishner's, that was a very clear example of having a different place where you sleep, where your bed is, where your dresser is, and a different place where you eat. So that text brought to mind uh, my dad and his Dishner experience. I'm going to go back to the diagrams the pictorial representations. And here on Daf Ayin Vav, 76 Amud Bet, so 76B, there's a pictorial representation here of apartments, essentially. And this diagram and the descriptions of it in the Talmud in Masechet Ravine really reminded me of my dad as well. Not the summers spent at Dishner's or the summers spent at the other bungalow, the fancy schmancy bungalow colonies, uh, but also apartment buildings. My dad grew up in an apartment building. My dad grew up uh, 225, I think that was the address, 225 Division Avenue, a, a five-story apartment building, and in that apartment building, he didn't, he lived there, but also his grandparents lived there, and also his cousins lived there. He had cousins in the building and down the block. He had, uh, my dad's name was David and he had three cousins, two in the building and one down the block who also had the name David, either as a first name or as a middle name. And they all ended up having nicknames because we couldn't all go by the name David. They must have all been named after the same you know, great grandfather, I think. Uh, and so my dad was known as Bussy. Don't ask. Um, my uncle. Uh, then there was Doody, who was Alvin David Finchler. Then there was Norman David Winkler, who was Nachi. And then there was David Cooper, uh, who was, what did he go by? Lutti. And my dad talked about uh, these guys and the time they spent at uh, Yeshiva Torvadas, where their very religious grandfather, Moshe Malik, who also lived in the building, uh, who he worked at their yeshiva at the yeshiva Torbadas. And I know my dad and the people in his class, the many of whom were family members, they played spitball, baseball spitball. They tried to get the rabbi's beard, get the rabbi's forehead. And I'm not sure exactly how they translated this into baseball. My dad loved baseball, his cousins loved baseball. So somehow they worked out some kind of base system and home run. And they did this in class you know, in a very irreverent kind of way, not surprising. So this picture and the description of it remind me very much of my dad in his apartment building that he grew up in, in Division Avenue. Later on, my grandparents moved to Havemeyer Street, also in Williamsburg. Now I think all of these places are very high rent district. Uh, then it was considered very unsafe. It was a project that my grandparents lived in and there were multiple locks on the on the door. We were never allowed outside, meaning outside their apartment in the hallway or in the stairwell by ourselves. We had to go in the elevator up to the eighth floor where they lived or downstairs to the lobby, always accompanied by an adult. This picture brings back all of those memories. Uh, that was the second place my, my uh, dad lived. I don't think he lived there for very long. Uh, maybe he didn't even, I don't I know my grandparents lived there. That was the home that I associated with my grandparents, with Bobby Jane and Zybe Harry. One last diagram I wanted to share with you. This is 
from Daf Pei Zion Amud Aleph. It's page 87a in Masechet Erevin. Um, and what chapter is that? That's chapter 18. Yes. No, there is no chapter 18. Chapter 8. Kate Sad Mishtat Fin. So why does this picture remind me of my dad? Um, it's kind of a, a little sad. <laughs> why and how this reminds me of my dad. Uh, my dad had lots of dreams that were never fulfilled. And one of the dreams he had was to travel. And he, I don't think he ever left the country. And even in the country, he only went to a few states. When I lived in California, when I lived in San Francisco, he he came exactly twice. Uh, once when I first moved out there and once when I got married. And he just, you know, didn't get out much as uh, I know he had very much wanted to go to places that looked like this, uh, Italy or Venice, or uh, he just never, never made it there. One of the podcasts that I listen to is called Talk Talking Talmud by Yerdana Osban and Ann Gordon. And in their description of this staff of this page, they were talking about how the rabbis were, many of them may have been world travelers and that all of the different scenarios of Eru, of the reason why there's so many of them. I mean, this number 307, this is a diagram 307 in this book that's a companion to Masechet Eruvim. And it, according to Anne and Yardena, that a lot of what we see is not just the rabbi's immediate experience of their neighborhood and what their neighborhood looked like, but places that they had been, perhaps places not all around the world, but in their close proximity. In Babylonia, even like you know, the Talmud was it has oral traditions that existed from way back when, but they got written down in this period after the destruction of the temple, after the year 70. The center of Jewish life was no longer Jerusalem, and uh, many people moved to the north. Uh, the city of Tsipori in the north, in particular, was one uh, where they hadn't rebelled against the Romans, and they Rabbi Huda Hanasi live there and uh, it's very close to the Galilee. So the cities in the north are close to the Yom Kinneret. So there was water. I'm not sure if the housing situation looked exactly like this, uh, but there was definitely this idea of having a bucket and getting buckets from the water. And so that ends up leading in Tractate Erevim to a whole discussion about what happens when you live on the water and are you allowed to uh, carry water from this shared canal to your window, uh, or is that considered a Shabbat prohibition? Is there a way to create an Eruv that would enable you to do this kind of carrying on Shabbat? Uh, but as I said, this reminds me of my dad, mostly because of missed opportunities and how he didn't ever get to live or to see places that looked like this. And I'm going to end those diagrams on such a downer note. So I'm going to go back to my dad's happy place. My dad loved communal living, which is communal living is what the whole concept of Eruv is all about. You know, there are some people who dream of living in the suburbs and having their own backyard. And my dad certainly liked that. But uh, he really did thrive in places like the bungalow colonies and in apartment buildings uh, because there were always people around and he could schmooze, he could socialize, he could... Uh, play cards and softball uh, in the leagues that met on Sunday morning at the ca uh, in the Catskills at the Bungalow Colonies. So that, even though my dad didn't get to travel around the world, he did have some points in his life where he spent summers doing what he really loved. And uh, he absolutely loved his childhood growing up next to all of his cousins. And I have to say uh, that I'm so grateful that my own kids have so many cousins uh, and that they're close with them, even though they don't live in the same apartment building yet. <laughs> uh, they Many of them do live near each other. I mean, right now, Ariel is living in Brookline and his cousin, Greg, uh, who just got married to Talia, lives also in a Boston suburb and my uh, sister-in-law Dina lives in Boston and Miriam lives in Boston. Uh, there's a lot of, Bo Ronit is in Boston. Uh, it, it, it's really nice for cousins to live close to each other. And I'm really glad that my, my dad had that as a child. Okay, I'm now going to share another text. 
away from the diagrams, back to the text. That reminds me of my dad. So this is from Erevin 53. And uh, here we have another machloket, another difference of opinion, a debate between Rav and Shmuel. Chad tane me'aberin v'chad tane me'aberin. Man de tane me'aberin ever ever, uman de tane me'aberin ki isha ubara. So the Gemara cites a dispute with regard to the Mishnah's terminology. And I say this, ta this terminology has to do with that other kind of Eruv that I mentioned briefly before. There's Eruv Chatzerot, which is this Eruv that enables you to merge courtyards and to be able to carry on Shabbat. But there's also another kind of Eruv, Eruv Tehumim, which uh, it's based, it's a, it's a leniency to enable you to deal with the restrictions against walking very far on Shabbat. So there is a prohibition against walking more than 2,000 cubits, 2,000 uh, amot away from where you live uh, in either direction. So you have like this 4,000 amot span where you're allowed to travel on Shabbat. And what do you consider your place of residence? Is it the actual house? Well, according to Masech Erevin, or at least the consensus that seems to develop is that if you're in a city, it's the city limits. Like you go according to the city limits and how do you draw uh, the line, the circle or the square around a city. And in this chapter, in chapter five, Kate Sad Ma'aburin, there's this description of how most cities, they're not made in exact square or an exact circle. There are protrusions. The protrusion might be in the form of a, a turret or uh, an extra wing of a building or you know something jutting out or in some way making it not a complete circle and not a smooth circle or a square. And the word that's used to create that um, circle or square around the city so you know what the city limit is for purposes of observing this prohibition of not going beyond the Tchum Shabbat, beyond the Shabbat. Shabbat limits. The word is me'aberin. And the debate here is about whether you spell this word with an ayin or an aleph. So one, Rav and Shmuel, we're not sure who, who was who here. Maybe Rav, the first opinion, taught that the term in the Mishnah is me'aberin with the letter ayin. And one taught that the term in the Mishnah is me'aberin with the letter aleph. And then they explain why the, the different letters. The Gemara explains the one who taught me'aberin with an aleph explained the term in the sense of a limb, ever limb by limb, so these protrusions from a city can be viewed as limbs sticking out. Determination of the city's borders involves the addition of limbs to the core section of the city. And the one who taught Ma'aburin with an ayin explained the term in the sense of a pregnant woman, Ubara, whose belly protrudes. In similar fashion, all the city's protrusions are incorporated in its Shabbat limit. And this, in fact, is one of the leniencies of Eruv Tehumim is the fact that you're not, not only are you saying that you can go beyond the confines of your house, you can go beyond the city limit. And in determining the city limit, instead of going to like the smallest part where there are houses, you're going as large as possible to where the protrusions are. So why and how does this have anything to do with my dad at all? This whole section of the Gemara, it starts out with this olive versus ayin, and then it ends up discussing other clever use of letter, uh, uh, discussions about letters and words, and my dad loved word games. My dad loved uh, crossword puzzles and jumbles, and in this section of the Talmud, I'm going to show you again another favorite of mine, which may or may not have to do with my dad. <laughs> it does. So there's this whole discussion that starts with the Aleph and the Ayin, and then it has, uh, it says, have, having discussed the clever speech of various sages, the Gemara relates that Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hanania said as follows, in all my days, no person defeated me in a verbal encounter except for a woman, a young boy, and a young girl. And gives examples of that, all having to do with defeated in the sense of verbal encounter. Uh, and verbal sparring. But this is, um, let me find it, in, I like it in Hebrew, and then I'll do it in English as well. So the, while they're talking about verbal encounters, uh, and since they were talking about women, all right, we'll talk about another woman who is very sharp-witted and who uses her language well is Bruria. So it's actually not Hebrew, it's Aramaic here. Bruria, 
Ashachte lahahu talmida de hava kagares belichisha. Okay, that's not the one I was looking for. Here we go. Rabbi Yosei haglili hava ka azel beorcha. Ashkecha levoria. So Rabbi uh, Yosi the Galilean, he was walking on the road and he happed upon, he had a chance meeting with Bruria. Uh, Bruria was very wise, married to Rabbi Meir, daughter of um, one of the rabbis, uh, uh, Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion, who was one of the martyrs who was killed by Hadrian during the Hadrianic persecutions in the second century CE. Uh, Bruria, in enough in her own right. She had a father who was a rabbi, a husband who was a rabbi. She herself was really very scholarly. Women couldn't be rabbis in those days. But uh, Rabbi Yossi Haglili, he bumps into Bury along the street and he's looking for directions. Okay. So a man asking for directions, boy, in and of itself, that seems pretty uh, off-brand, <laughs> but I digress. So he says to her, Be'eze derech ne'lech le'lod. What road shall I take to go to Lod? And she says to him, Amrale, Galilee Shote, you foolish Galilean. Lo kachamru chachamim, didn't the sages teach Altar Besicha im Haisha? Didn't the sages, you are one of the sages, didn't you teach that you're not supposed to engage in conversation for too long with women? And here, the very thing that you teach, this is a quote from Pirkei Avot, even uh, these, these things that you teach, you're not going by because you could have asked that very same question when you were asking for directions. You didn't have to use four Hebrew words. You could have used just two Hebrew words. Hayal you should have just said, Be'ezel elod. How to load. In English, it's even more of a difference of a uh, number of words here. Here it is here. So he says to her, on which path shall we walk in order to get to Lod? It's a mouthful. And then she said, you could have just said, which way to Lod? So she wins that verbal sparring match. So again, what does this have to, anything to do with my dad? My dad, uh, as I said, loved uh, crossword puzzles. He loved word games. He loved word plays. I don't know if you, uh, any of you know what a jumble is. Uh, there used to be junior jumble and the regular jumbles. My father absolutely loved them and taught me how to do them from a very young age. Uh, it's where you have a bunch of words that are anagrams. So it's things are all jumbled up, the letters, and you have to figure out what the actual word is. And then you put it in, say, it'll have, say it's a six letter word. There's six blanks and you put in the correct spelling of the word. You unscramble the word. And then there's certain words, certain letters that have circles around them. And then you take each of the letters that has a circle around it. And then all of those letters then have to become unscrambled in order to give you an answer, a secret answer. And what we did at my 11th birthday party, I remember my dad constructed a jumble that uh, had a bunch of different clues, I forget, five or six, but the answer, when you took the circles from each of the answers and put it together, the answer was where the prize was to be found. And so what was the prize? I remember this also so distinctly. It was a Holly Hobby Wishing Well diary, a pink diary with gold pages that my dad, we hid in the piano bench. I had a piano that was given to me as a gift by my Zaidi Harry and Bobby Jane when, um, when I was in fourth grade, I think is when I started taking piano lessons. It wasn't very good. <laughs> but at this 11-year-old uh, birthday party, this is where we hid the gift. And I remember this so distinctly, and I remember how much my dad really enjoyed putting together that jumble. Uh, I also remember having a at that same birthday party, a word search, a giant word search that was hanging over the back of a door. It was like, it was made into a poster and the word search included all the names of the people who were at my party, the guests who were at my party. So uh, very fond memories of my dad and his word games. The next three texts I wanted to share with you all feature a personality. Uh, his name was Rav Yosef. And uh, I'll show you the first one. There's a, a pattern here. So this first text is from Erevin Daf 10a, Yud Amud Aleph. It's chapter one of Masechet Erevin. Oh, I did not mean to do that. 
And there is a discussion here about uh, a mavoi, an alleyway, and how you can const construct an area for it. Those are those original diagram, first diagrams that I showed you with the alleyway with the houses close by. And I showed you the lechi, the side post, and the kora, the cross beam, and the tzurat petach, the appearance of a doorway. It's a whole discussion about it. And um, Rav Yosef said, let's read in Hebrew first. Amar Rav, actually it's Aramaic, Amar Rav Yosef, la shemia li ha shematata. Amar le abaye, at amart nihalan, va aha amart nihalan. What does that mean? Translation right here. Rav Yosef said, I did not hear this halacha from my teachers. He couldn't recall that there was a, the halacha, the law that there was being discussed was about the lechi, the side post, about whether or not one that is visible only from the outside of the alleyway is considered to have the legal status of a side post for the purposes of creating an eruv. And Rav Yosef just didn't remember hearing the halacha that was being cited. And his student Abaye said to him, you, you yourself taught us this halacha, this Jewish law. And it was with regard to this that you told it to us. And then he cites Rav Yosef's own teaching back to Rav Yosef. And now we have this same interchange between Rav Yosef and Abaye in a different part of the Talmud, later on in chapter 6, Erevin 73a. This was the whole uh, discussion about uh, whether it's your place where you sleep or the place where you eat that determines your dwelling place. And again, you have Rav Yosef saying, I have not heard this halacha. And again, his student Abaye says to him, you yourself said it to us. And it was with regard to this that you said it to us. And he cites Rav Yosef's own teaching back to him. We have the same situation again, similar situation uh, in Chapter 9, Kol Gagot in Erevin 89b, you have Rav Yosef saying again, La Shemia li ha shamatata, Amar li abaye, at amart nihalan, va aha amart nihalan. Rav Yosef said, I have not heard this halacha. This time it's a halacha, Jewish law of Shmuel, respect, uh, with respect to uh, a roof, whether you can carry from one, a roof from one apartment building to another, or the roof of one individual home to another, or can you carry even on a roof? Uh, does the roof have to have an Eruv? Whatever the discussion is that's being cited, Rav Yosef has said he hasn't heard it. And he's not saying it in a way that is, I don't believe you. It's more like, I used to know this, but I don't remember. And then you have his very kind, loving student reminding him of his own teaching in a way that doesn't embarrass him. It's especially tragic with Rav Yosef that he doesn't remember his own teachings, because Rav Yosef was considered to be what's known as a Sinai. You know, Mount Sinai uh, is the mountain where the Ten Commandments, the rest of the Torah was given. And there's another text here, not from Masechet Eruvin, but from Masechet Brachot, which was the first tractate that I started studying, my dad's memory. Find it. Here we go. So in Brachot 64a, there's this lovely story here, an incident involving Rabba and Rav Yosef. So Rav Yosef was a Sinai. He was extremely erudite. And Rabba was an Oker Harim, literally means one who uproots mountains, one who is extremely sharp. Um, there's more ways to distinguish between those two teaching styles. Sinai is someone who has a very large knowledge base, who, who can spit information back to you very quickly. An Oker Harim might not necessarily have that same knowledge base, but he's able to, he understands things, he has analytical skills. Uh, a, a Sinai is someone who may have a breadth of knowledge, whereas an Oker Harim may be someone who has more of a depth of knowledge and critical thinking skills. In any event, there were these two different rabbis and the moment arrived when they were needed. One of them was to be headed, was to be chosen as the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the Yeshiva. And a question was asked. Here it is in Hebrew. Sinai ve'oker harim, eze mehem kodem. Which takes priority? Which is better? To be a Sinai or to be an oker harim? To be someone who has vast knowledge or it's someone who has 
analytical skills and knows how to take whatever knowledge they have and apply it to new situations. And the answer what, that was given to them was Sinai Kodem, Shahakol Trichim Lemare Chitaya. Here's the translation. Sinai takes precedence for everyone needs the owner of the wheat, one who is expert, an expert in, in the sources. Nevertheless, Rav Yosef didn't accept the appointment. Uh, Rabbi, and it turns out that Rabbi presided as head of the yeshiva for 22 years. And after he died, Rav Yosef presided for two and a half years. And uh, then I'll skip to this. The Gemara relates that all those years that Rabbi presided, Rav Yosef did not even call a blood letter to his home. So that was a sign of kavod, of honor that was afforded to someone who was the Rosh Yeshiva. The blood letter would come to your home instead of you having to go to the blood letters, kind of like a doctor making house calls. So what does all of this or any of this have to do with my dad? Rav Yosef was someone who was really brilliant and, and then forgot what he learned. He was not the same man on those first texts that I showed you than he was in Masechet Brachot, the one where he's being considered for the position of Rosh Yeshiva. And I think it's the case with any of us who have parents, uh, elderly parents, my dad was not that old, but parents who are sick, uh, particularly parents who have had, or are, do have Alzheimer's or dementia, it's very, very difficult as a child to see that happen to your parents. Uh, I know for my husband, for Adi, when his, when his father, Alava Shalom, when uh, Aaron was sick, it, it, he had cancer, but he didn't have Alzheimer's, he didn't have dementia, but at some point the cancer went to his brain and he was not making sense anymore. And I think that was especially painful. And I know uh, for anybody who's had a, a parent who suffered memory loss, who's had any cognitive impairment, it's really painful. My dad, I was, I guess I was lucky, or he was lucky, fortunate that uh, he didn't have cognitive impairments. Um, he, you know, only at the very, very end when he was in his hospital room, um, at, you know, when there were toxins going to his brain, but for the most part, he, he maintained his intellect and he maintained his memory, but he did change a lot. I have to say over the last 25 years, 30 years, my dad morphed into a different person than he was when I was growing up. Um, when I was growing up, my dad was very happy-go-lucky, uh, sociable, uh, the life of the party, told jokes, told stories. Uh, he, his wit was incredible. And he still maintained a lot of that growing up uh, as he got older, but he didn't have that same sparkle in his eyes. He had the most beautiful eyes, these hazel eyes, but he never quite had the sparkle. Uh, and watching that, being his daughter and watching him just deteriorate in that way, you know, wasn't uh, I said it wasn't a memory loss, but it was more of a loss of drive. Um, just a, a sadness about my dad that made that made me sad in turn, and uh, you know, unfortunately, my dad didn't have a student like a baye by his side to remind him of what he used to be like. But he did have his girlfriend Pat of 27 years, uh, and for that, I am eternally grateful. And now I'm reaching my final set of texts and what I wanted to say about my dad and the mourning process in particular. So here I'm going to share screen again. This is from chapter seven of Masechet Erevin, page 80a, Daf Pei Amud Aleph. It's a maase, a happening, an incident. Uh, you may be familiar with the term Bubamaisa, which is a derogatory term referring to a story that a grandmother makes up. This is not necessarily a story that was made up, but there's a lot of ma'asim, a lot of uh, a ma'ase uh, from which a Jewish law can be derived or a discussion about Jewish law can evolve. So ma'ase bechalato shal rabbi Oshaya shal chal veta merchatz ve chashchala ve ervala chamota. There was an incident involving the daughter-in-law of Rabbi Oshaya, who went before Shabbat to the bathhouse. And the bathhouse was located beyond the Shabbat boundary, the Tzachum Shabbat, and it grew dark before she was able to return. So she was more than 2,000 amots away from the city limits of where she actually lived. 
and her mother-in-law established a joining of Shabbat boundaries, uh, an Eruv, uh, it says Erva Lachamuta, her, her mother-in-law established some kind of Eruv to expand the Shabbat boundaries so that she could return home. And the incident came before Rabbi Chia for a ruling as to whether that Eruv Tehumim was valid. And he ruled that it was not valid and he prohibited her to return to her home. So she ended up having to spend Shabbos uh, out there wherever the bathhouse was. Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yossi, said to him, to Rabbi Chia, Bavlai kol kachata machmir be'eruvin, kachamar abba, kol she'yesh lecha lahakel be'eruvin, hakel. Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yossi, said to Rabbi Chia, Babylonian, are you so stringent with regard to an Eruv? This is what my father taught me. Any case where you have the ability to be lenient with regard to an Eruv, be lenient. And that's a recurring theme throughout Masechet Eruvin, this idea of leniency, uh, the, the whole concept, the whole construct of an Eruv is a leniency that the rabbis developed to enable people to deal with the inconvenience of the Malacha, the 39th Malacha prohibition against carrying Mirashut Lirashut from one domain to the next on Shabbat or more than four Amon, more than four cubits within one domain. So this idea comes up, and actually this statement comes up a few times in Masechet Eruvin, reminding us that when you have a choice of being stringent or, or lenient within any one subset discussion about Eruvin, you should err on the lenient side. So here you have in Eruvin Memvav, in Eruvin 46a, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said, Halacha k'divrei ha-mekel be'eruv. The halacha is in accordance with the lenient opinion with regard to an eruv. And then while we're in discussion of leniencies and leniencies with regard to Eruv, we end up with a discussion about the laws of mourning, of Avelut. Here's the English. If a person receives a proximate report that one of his close relatives has died, he practices all of the customs of the intense seven-day mourning period, the entire Shiva, as well as the customs of the Shloshim, the 30-day mourning period. But if he receives a distant report, he practices only one day of Avelut, only one day of mourning. What is considered a proximate report? And what is considered a distant report? Uh, the Hebrew words used here are Shmua Krova and Shmua Rechoka. Okay, so a Shmua Krova. If the report arrives within 30 days of the close relative's passing, it's regarded as proximate, Krova. But if the news arrives after 30 days, it's considered distant, Rechoka. This is the statement of Rabbi Akiva. But the rabbis say, both in the case of a proximate report and a distant report, the grieving relative practices the seven-day mourning period, Shiva, and the 30-day mourning period, the Shloshim. So in this debate between Rabbi Akiva and the rabbis, the majority rule here, uh, the majority, uh, they're more stringent. Uh, so this is the way it's described anyway as a stringency. So I'm not going to read this part, it's a little complicated, but it says here, uh, halacha is in accordance with the words of the stringent authorities. Actually, and I'll read the whole thing, otherwise it won't make sense. Uh, Rabbi Barbarchana said that Rabbi Yochanan said, Rabbi Barchana in the name of his teacher Rabbi Yochanan taught, wherever you find that a single authority is lenient with regard to a certain halacha, a certain Jewish law, and that several other authorities are stringent, the halacha is in accordance with the words of the stringent authorities who constitute the majority, except, this is the exception to the rule, except for here, in the case of mourning practices, where despite the fact that the opinion of Rabbi Akiva is lenient and the opinion of the rabbis is more machmir, more stringent, the halacha, the Jewish law, is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Yochanan holds like Shmuel. As Shmuel said, the halacha is in accordance with the lenient opinion with regard to mourning practices. Wherever there is a dispute with regard to mourning customs, the Jewish law, the halacha, is in accordance with the lenient opinion. And we have this statement here by Shmuel, halacha kedivrei hamekel be'evel. Be'evel. Be'avel. Avelut is the noun that means um, 
mourning period. Um, an Avel is a, a mourner. So just how we had this statement up above about the halacha kedi reha mekel be'eruv, that you err on the side of leniency when it comes to the laws of Eruv, so too do you err on the side of leniency when it comes to the laws of Avelut. And I wanted to conclude by commenting on this section of the Gemara. You know, saying Kaddish, uh, as when you say the Kaddish for a parent, you say Kaddish for 11 months minus one day. You're, you're, uh, you do mourning, the other strictures of mourning for the full 12 months, like abstaining, um, going to live concerts, et cetera. Of course, not that I had much opportunity to do that with COVID. I found it very interesting, this idea of what it means to be lenient versus what it means to be stringent. So what it means to be lenient, according to the rabbis in this tractate, is to be obligated to fewer days of mourning. So if you find out about uh, the death of a relative and it happened more than 30 days ago, Rabbi Akiva said, let's be Mekel. Let's err on that side of leniency. You don't have to do all of these laws of mourning. And I originally thought of, more, of saying Kaddish as being a stringency, of course, because it's tough. It's tough to go from, you know, I'm going to, I do most of my davening at home alone, or, you know, I, I don't insist on going to a minion for every single time I daven, except when I'm in New Jersey, in Aberdeen, and my shul is having a minion, my shul is uh, having a service. Obviously, if I'm leading it, I'm there. But even when I'm not leading it. But when I was in mourning, I felt compelled to daven two to three times a day to say Kaddish for my dad at Shacharit, Mincha, and or Mariv. And before COVID hit, I was really able to do that. And as I said, it did, it did feel like a stringency, but a stringency that I was willing to do, uh, it felt like the right thing to do. Uh, that was my chiyuv, my obligation. So when I was in New Jersey, in addition to going to Temple Beth Am, uh, whenever I say Friday mornings, we don't have a Friday morning minion at Beth Am. Uh, I went to, at first, the Young Israel of Aberdeen. Then I started going to the Young Israel of East Brunswick. Uh, I lived in East Brunswick for a few years and uh, reminds me of my dad. And so I went there uh, a couple of times. Um, there was one occasion I even went to uh, Lakewood, um, because that also reminded me of my dad, because my dad lived there, and I was visiting his girlfriend, Pat. I went to uh, a minion in Lakewood that didn't even have a women's section. I had to literally stand outside, and I could barely hear the Kaddish. I had to kind of physically move my ear to the wall in order to, to hear something, but I still felt like I was saying Kaddish. And when I was in Pennsylvania, I said Kaddish at Har Zion, at Adith Israel, at Beth Hillel, at Lower Marion Synagogue. Uh, Lower Marion Synagogue had uh, the most convenient minion time. I think uh, it's an Orthodox synagogue and they had multiple minions in the morning and their latest one was at eight o'clock. So uh, that's the one that I often went to uh, for morning minion. I also went there for Mincha. It was the, one of the only shuls uh, in the area in Pennsylvania that had a, that had a Mincha at a time that was convenient. So this was all November, December, January, February, first week in March. And then about four months after my dad died and the coronavirus started to spread, there was, I went abruptly from saying Kaddish two to three times a day to not being able to say it at all. Uh, there was actually a little transition period that I was, I had gotten sick, who knows, it may have been COVID, I don't think so. I was diagnosed with the flu. I couldn't, I couldn't leave the house on Purim and Adi went to shul at Temple Beth Am and he actually had the phone out during the Megillah reading and also during Kaddish so that I could say Kaddish remotely. And that didn't, it felt, I felt a little bit cheated and who knew that that was going to be my future because after COVID-19 hit, there was, you really couldn't go to in-person minions for a while. Oop, there's the dog barking. So at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, I was davening home alone. I reached out to a friend and colleague, uh, Rabbi David Shuck, who was also saying Kaddish for his father. And uh, he had a prayer in place of Kaddish that he had told me about. 
uh, and uh, it's by Rabbi Edelstein. There's also in Sidor Lev Shalem in the side column of Mourner's Kaddish for Friday night. It, if you don't have a minion, it has a suggested prayer that you can say when you don't have a minion. I found it kind of hollow saying those. Uh, you know, sometimes it felt good, sometimes not. Um, I, it, sometimes it felt real, I should say, and sometimes it didn't feel real. But eventually I was able to start going to means again. Um, I, we started at Temple Beth Am having a minion every day, sometimes twice a day on Zoom. So that was a little uncomfortable at first. I mean, halachically, you need to have 10 people in person over the age of bar bar mitzvah. We didn't have 10 uh, in person. It's all virtual, but uh, I, there were some adaptations that were made and some kind of uh, leniencies for during the time of COVID where my psak is, and following Rabbi Avi, Avi Reisner, is that yes, in ideal times, you need 10 in person for a virtual minion. But during this Sha'at HaDzachak, during this uh, extenuating circumstance that we will allow Kaddish, not, you know, not all of my colleagues hold by this, um, and some of my colleagues allow uh, all of the sections of the service that require a minion, they will allow it with a virtual minion. I only allow it for Mourner's Kaddish. Um, in any event, I have been able to participate in Zoom minions. And then recently, over the last couple of months, as some places have started to open, particularly over the summer where we had outdoor services at Temple Beth Am occasionally, and we also had for high holidays and for Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret and, and, and some Katara. I, I, it was amazing to be able to say Kaddish again. Uh, it was obviously very strange circumstances where everyone wearing masks and socially distant and not feeling the same community and not as many people at Shul, obviously, uh, but at least being able to say Kaddish again. You know, I want to th just conclude by talking about Kaddish because I really do struggle with the idea of whether it's a leniency or a stringency. Uh, but before I even say that, I just want to say I, at the beginning when I was saying Kaddish for my dad before COVID, it really felt, well, I guess it's, it's part of my description of why this is a stringency. So... <laughs> It felt very much like, I'd say, a burden, um, a burden that I took upon myself, that I felt obligated to do, uh, that I that I needed to do for the sake of my dad, uh, for honoring my dad. Um, but when it was taken away from me, I felt like, I didn't feel like, wow, this is great. I now have a leniency. I don't have to go to shul anymore. I can just say Kaddish at home. Yes, it was much easier, but it wasn't a leniency that I welcomed. And in fact, I craved being able to say Kaddish in person or at least on Zoom some way of interacting with other people while saying Kaddish and not just being alone in my house saying Kaddish. So... Yes, saying Kaddish, it's a stringency in a sense uh, because it takes time and you have to carve out times of your day in order to do this. Saying Kaddish is also a stringency when you view it from the perspective of saying it for the mourner, right? So uh, elevating the soul of the deceased. Uh, you know, this read you a section from more recent Lamb's famous, very famous book, The Jewish Way and Death and Mourning. He writes that the rabbis have long declared that a person is obligated to honor parents in death as well as in life. Kaddish is the verbal demonstration of a deep and abiding honor that Jews were bidden to give parents since the day the fifth commandment was pronounced on Sinai. The very duration of the Kaddish recitation for parents is ample testimony to that respect. Because the wicked soul is said to undergo judgment for a full 12 months, the child, in reverence for his parent, ends the Kaddish a month earlier, at 11 months minus one day, bearing witness in one month's eloquent silence to the goodness of those who bore him. So yes, Kaddish is very much about the, the deceased. It was very much about my dad, about elevating his neshama. But also, if, I think on the other hand, if you view saying mourners Kaddish as being for the mourner as well, not just for the deceased, to help mark the time, to give structure to the grieving process, then Rabbi Akiva's opinion is not such a leniency. Uh, it's actually a stringency. 
because it shortens the mourning period. The fact that Rabbi Akiva was saying, ah, you only have to mourn for a day in this situation. Yes, it's a leniency on the surface, but for people who want to be able to say Kaddish and feel the need and the obligation to say Kaddish for a parent, to be told or to be put in a situation where they can't say it or don't are not obligated to say it, it doesn't feel so much like a, a welcome leniency. For those of us who mourn, having days taken away from the mourning period is, it feels like a stringency, not a leniency. You know, as difficult as this past year was for all of us because of the pandemic, especially in those early months of chaos and unstructured time when the days blurred into each other and Shabbat barely felt different than the rest of the week. I really appreciated the structure of a daily prayer services and saying Mourner's Kaddish. And I feel very blessed that I had the opportunity in whatever disjointed way possible, given COVID, to be able to have sent Kaddish for the full period of time as much as possible, and also to be able to say Kaddish on my dad's first year at site. May the memory of David Ben Aharon Svi Vishendo be for a blessing. Thank you for joining me and honoring his memory in this way.